This is Adventist World Radio Ghana. Voice of Hope. Ghana. Voice of Hope. The program lineup are from Reflections, Family Affairs, and Moment of Truth. My name is Sydney Ni Okailami. And I'm Abnan Kitia. I hope you enjoy the program lineup for today. Please stay tuned. The poor men say I am rich in him. Let the lost men say I am found in him. And let the river flow. Let the blind men say I can see again. Let the dead men say. have every right to reflect on it. Please enjoy Reflections. Our devotion for today is entitled, Witness of the Gods at the Tomb. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Matthew 28, verse 4. But where were the Roman gods? They had been enabled to view the mighty angel who sang the song of triumph at the birth of Christ. The angels now sang the songs of redeeming love. When the heavenly train was hidden from their sight, they arose to their feet and made their way as quickly as their torturing limbs would carry them to the gate of the garden. 
As they came up, staggering like blind or drunken men, their faces pale as the dead, they told those they met of the wonderful scenes they had witnessed. Messengers preceded them quickly to the chief priests and rulers, declaring as best they could the incidents that had taken place. The guards were making their way first to Pilate, but the priests and rulers sent word for them to be brought into their presence. The hardened soldiers presented a strange appearance as they bore testimony both to the resurrection of Christ and also the multitude whom he brought forth with him as the one who holds life-given power. They had not time to think or speak anything but the truth. They thought their story would at once commend itself to the supposedly righteous men who had employed them. But the rulers were not pleased by the report. The soldiers were bribed to report a falsehood, and their priest guaranteed that if the matter came to Pilate's ears as it most assuredly would, they would be responsible for the actions of the soldiers. They bribed Pilate to silence. They did more. By special messengers, they sent the reports that they had prepared to every part of the country. Many had believed on Jesus as they saw the terrible sights that took place. They remember the voice that was heard at the foot of the cross with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done. They feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. All eyes were turned to the place from whence came the voice. Who had spoken? It was the centurion and the Roman soldiers, heathen and idolaters. What so enlightened and convinced these men that they could not refrain from confessing their faith in Jesus? It was the sermon that was given in every action of Christ and in his silence under cruel abuse. In that lacerated, bruised, broken body hanging on the cross, the centurion recognized the form of the Son of God. Written by Ellen G. White, my name is Lois Amachi Marvel. The family is an institution from God. And what do we do to make our family stable? Stay tuned for Family Affairs. Welcome to Family Affairs. Today we are going to look at reproduction as a social function of the family. Last time we learned that the family is the fabric of society. And um, we deliberated on so many issues, and today's issue is on reproduction. To help me do this discussion are... Pastor Brent Coker, School of Theology and Missions, Valley University. Samuel S. Boatin, Lecturer, Education Department, Valley University. And I am your regular host, Bell Dollar Bill. Gentlemen, you are welcome. Thank you. To begin with, what is reproduction? Reproduction is uh, the meeting of a male and female in the marriage context to produce offspring. Pastor, you have anything to add to that? I would say when we talk of production, I will go back to scriptures. It is the opportunity that God gave mankind to continue creation, what we call procreation. So when we talk of reproduction, we are talking of recreating but this is the opportunity that god has given mankind that we should produce after our kind okay so reproduction is reproducing after our kind okay yeah it's common knowledge that in certain parts of the world same-sex marriage um, is encouraged what is your view about same-sex marriage and reproduction um we should take the bible as an example and whatever we do we should take you from what the bible says When God created in the beginning, he created male and female. He created a man 
and a woman. And so modern ideas and modern philosophies and ideologies of talking about same-sex marriage is unbiblical. It doesn't have any foundation because if one of the resultant of marriage is reproduction, children, that is also part of the fabric of family. How can you have same-sex marriage? Because there will be no reproduction. So what is the essence of same-sex marriages? Because reproduction can only happen between a male and a female. A woman will take seed from a man's sperm. So when a female and a female, they meet, nothing will happen. When a male and a male meet, no reproduction. So, this is you have something to add to that? Yes, I think I hold a similar point of view. Males and males marrying definitely will not result in any form of reproduction. And uh, from the way God created humankind, it is only through the sexual relationship in the opposite sex dimension that tries to bring off offspring. So the question of males and females of the same sex marrying actually has very little to do with reproduction. Okay. Again, God gave man the unction and the command reproduce, multiply, and replenish the earth. Mm -hmm. That command was given to a male and a female. And so, if we're thinking about reproduction, then it should be in a monogamous, heterosexual relationship. That is where we can have reproduction. Even with modern birth technologies, we should be careful. Sometimes we may have problems that we are creating by these new technologies, and when we are following it, we should really look to do what God instructs us okay. and be obedient to Him. Okay. Now, dwelling on this same-sex marriage and reproduction, I've heard stories of same-sex couples adopting, adopting children. What is your view on that? Who is the child going to refer to as mama and who is the child going to refer to as papa? And what do you think? That's interesting. That is one of the problems that we have. If you have the same-sex marriages, what roles? Because you have the same sex. And so why will one play father and another act? mother. It's more of acting. It is not real. And then it will create a problem for the child. What will the child learn as the child grows? What are the models? It's like you are naturally getting that child into that same sort of life, which is unnatural. And so the adoption, saying they want to adopt, is still not realistic because what the child will go through, the atmosphere, wouldn't really augur well for the child okay. to develop Naturally. Mm. Mr. Watson, you have something? It looks as if those who are marrying, like uh, I'm a male, I'm marrying a male. One of the reasons given by those people is that females have more diseases than even the men. Therefore, if I'm able to marry a man, it will be better than going to marry a female who has more diseases than marry a man. But that argument is very flimsy because these sexually transmitted diseases are even common among homosexuals so and lesbians for that matter so so that 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 argument is not tenable and as you rightly said if you go and adopt a child as for that one a male and a female is going to produce them for you to go and adopt so i don't know what and the when they are babies who gives their breast milk yes I, I don't understand but well that is what is happening and okay. i think if you go back to the bible to Take what God has said, it okay. is better. Okay, our time is up. Um, we'll have to round up here, but just a sentence before we well, draw the curtain. Before you draw the curtain, sex is meant for a man and a woman. Sex. And one of the functions of sex is for pleasure, it's for fun, it's for commitment, and for reproduction. Okay. I think I share the same view. It is good that what God ordained that naturally people should enjoy must be enjoyed as such. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, in case you just joined in, dear listener, we've been looking at one of the social functions of the family, which is reproduction. And uh, we have learned that reproduction is possible between heterosexual relationships. Until we come your way with part two of this discussion, I've been doing this discussion with... Pastor Bryant Coker. Samuel S. Boatin. And I have been your host, Bill Dollar Bill. God richly bless you. The 
This is Daylight Magazine. You can write to us at Adventist World Radio Ghana, Valley View University, P.O. Box AF595, Adenta, Accra, Ghana, West Africa. You can also email us at awr at vvu.edu.gh. Truth shall set you free. It's not time to know the truth on Moment of Truth. Calling for you and for me. Calling for you and me. Beyond the portals, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you. Brethren, you are welcome to Moment of Truth. I am Pastor Nana Kwesi Sapo O.R. Jr. I want to thank you once again for purposing to be with God and then to listen to His precious word that is there to mold and shape you as to how you are supposed to conduct yourself and then send forward. This time around, we're going to listen to a presentation caption, Why Does God Allow the Innocent to Suffer? Why Does God Allow the Innocent to Suffer? Brethren, shall we have a word of prayer? Daddy Lord, your children are listening to you. I pray that you will come and pull today so that they will be ginger to be builders for your church to also be built. In your name have I prayed with thanksgiving. Amen. Why does God allow the innocent to suffer? Why does God allow the innocent to suffer? Brethren, I know you have been asking yourself so many questions. And this one is not an assumption. You have asked yourself this question some time back. Why does God allow the innocent to suffer? And I want to ask, have you gotten an answer? In your quest in answering this question, have you had a bad notion or a false notion as to the authenticity of God? Have you ever done that? Brethren, why does God allow the innocent to suffer? Is one of the most difficult questions for Christians to answer. The problem of pain 
As the well-known Christian scholar C.S. Lewis once called it, is atheism most potent weapon against the Christian faith. All through science and history, if rightly understood, supports the fact of God. This evidence is so strong that, as the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, Psalm 14, verses 1. Even science and then history proves that there is God. When you look at how man was created, even when we take the creation of this universe, you see that it is organized in such a way that there is order in our creation. But people doubt the existence of God. The Bible says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 41 verses 1. Most atheists, therefore, without any objective evidence on which to base their faith in no God, must resort finally to philosophical objections. And this problem of suffering is the greatest of these. That is, they say, how can a God of love permit such a thing in his world as war, sickness, pain, and death, especially when their effects often are felt most keenly by those who are apparent innocent? So they claim that he is not a God of love and is indifferent to human suffering, or else he is not a God of power and is therefore helpless to do anything about it. They claim that either God is not love as he claimed to be, or he is not God of power, therefore helpless to do anything about it. God sees what is going on, but God can't do anything. He doesn't have any power. And then the other claim is that God is not love as he claimed to be. That is what people are saying. Brethren, in either case, the biblical God, who is supposedly one of both absolute power and perfect love, becomes an impossible anachronism, or so they claim. This is a real difficulty, but atheism is certainly not the answer, and neither is agnosticism. While there is much evil in the world, there is even more that is good. There is good even though there is evil, but there is more that is good. This is proof by the mere fact that people normally try to hang on to life as long as they can. Furthermore, brethren, everyone instinctively recognizes that good is a higher order of truth than bad. Every person on this earth knows that good is a higher order of truth than bad. We need also to recognize that our very minds were created by God. We can only use these minds to the extent that he allows. And it is therefore utterly presumptuous for us to use them, to question him and his motives. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Genesis chapter 18 verse 25 asks us that. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Shall the things formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? That is Romans chapter 9 verses 20. We ourselves do not establish the standard of what is right. Only the creator of all reality can do that. We need to settle it in our minds and hearts, whether we understand it or not, that whatever God does is by definition of right. Having settled this by faith, we are then free to seek for ways in which we can profit spiritually from the sufferings in life, as well as the blessings. As we consider such matters, it is helpful to keep the following great truth continually in our minds. There is really no such thing as the innocent suffering. There is really no such thing as the innocent suffering. We think that the innocent are suffering. There is really no such thing as the innocent suffering. Since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 verses 23. There is no one who has the right to freedom from God's wrath on the basis of his own innocence. As far as babies are concerned and others who may be incompetent mentally to distinguish right and then wrong. It is clear from both scripture and universe experience that they are sinners by nature and thus will inevitably become sinners by choice as soon as they are able to do so.
And it's only children that doesn't know even the difference between right and wrong. And for us grown up, we know the difference between right and wrong. And the Bible says that all of us have was sin. And we should know that God cursed this world because of sin. And if such things are happening to us, we should know that it is the consequences of sin. If you are not able to give back, if your work is not thriving, if you've been failing in examination, if you've been experiencing marital problems, if you've been experiencing a whole lot of spiritual attacks and a whole lot of problems, don't point hands at God. It is as a result of sin that all those things have come in. And I pray to God that as we still journey in this sinful world, he will let his power and his spirit come in and augment us all in our way so that whatever that we do, we shall be enlightened as to how to do it so that we shall benefit from the protection of the Lord. May the Lord richly bless us as we have brought this section or this part to a conclusion. Shall we have a word of prayer? I am Pastor Nana Kwesi Sapo O. Earl Jr. Daddy Lord, we want to thank you once again for being with us. We want to thank you for your precious word that you've given to us. May you help us so that we can do thou say the Lord and do what you cherish so that when you come back, we shall be among the saints. In your name have we prayed with thanksgiving. Amen. is Daylight Magazine. You can write to us at Adventist World Radio Ghana, Valley View University, P.O. Box AF 595, Adenta, Accra, Ghana, West Africa. You can also email us at awr at vvu.edu.gh A-W-R, voice of hope. We will bring Keep hope alive. It has been Sydney Ni Okain Lami and Elena Bnanketia. God richly bless you. Bye bye.